Our first speaker will be Juliette Leclerc. She has come to us from Rouen in France. She works as a researcher, as a sound critic, and as a curator. She's the author of two book-length essays. Uh, one is Extremely Loud, Sound as a Weapon. The other is more recently, uh, Contrôle, Comment s'inventer l'art de la manipulation sonore. Uh, as a co-editor of Santon, she's also putting out an online review magazine dedicated to radio and sound art. And today she will speak about how sound is used to shape public spaces and our individual behavior in these public spaces. Juliette, thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Uh, my presentation is so is, uh, entitled Sonic Fences in Public Spaces. And I will read it because uh, my English is not as fluent as that, so I cannot improvise in English so much. So I'm sorry for the reading uh, tone of the presentation. If I tell you to think about the sound of the city, you will probably first think about what has become known as sound pollution, which is in fact referring to the overwhelming sounds inherited from the second revolu industrial revolution, car engines, subway traffic, air conditioning. Then if I ask you to think about sound, sounds regulating the city, you might think about car horns, police whistles, or acoustic signals for the visually impaired at crossroads. These are the ancestors of a new category of sounds emerging in the contemporary city, which altogether built what we could call a sonic urbanism. These new sounds have not been decided by a superior authority. They are hardly coordinated by any instance, yet they share a common logic. There are a thousand scattered experimentations but they converge in the way they perceive the city, our roots inside it, public space, and human behavior. Indeed, those private or strictly local initiatives are built upon the idea that sound can and must modify behaviors so as to preserve a specific uh, social order. I will therefore talk about a few pieces of that puzzle a few elements of the huge building site that sonic public space has become. Once we put them together, they start to make sense. You will hear several French examples, and that is not because I want to take the opportunity of a symposium to do some touristic advertising, but first because France represents my main listening field, and second, because France actually appears for the better and also for the worse, mainly for the worse, I would say, to have developed quite a lot what we call sound design and sound branding. That is the use of carefully crafted sounds for industrial, artistic, or commercial purposes. Let me take you through a virtual sound walk into the emerging city. Here are the six stops we'll be making. The enchanting sound, Sonic signposting. Palais des Sports. The safety sound. Dominos. The regulating sound. The sound of social control. The sound of law and order. First stop, the uh, enchanting sound. So let's hear it again a little bit longer. This probably already sounds very familiar. I recorded that piece in a mall called Les Halles in Paris. At the time, in 2013, big renovation works were undergoing and the sound broadcast in a precise corridor was meant to cover up the noise uh, or rather to crown it with a little bit of would-be poetry. It was composed by Michel Redolfi and we can trace its inspiration back to the mother of all background music.
music. We've been accustomed to background music in public or private places for almost a century. The objective of that kind of sound is to re-enchant public spaces and to put us in an adequate mood to buy. It has, in fact, a long history of so-called scientific methods to maximize the impact of mathematically organized playlists. Whether it is efficient in that respect remains dubious. Yet, background music does manage to transform our daily landscapes into an immediately recognizable decorum. Its role is, in fact, to enunciate in an informal way whose acoustic territory we're in, what kind of attitude is expected of us, who is or is not welcome in a specific territory. Classical music, for instance, usually aims at telling teenagers, whatever their own musical taste, that they should go away. Whereas loud hits suggest the other 30s to go and shop elsewhere. We are quite free to behave exactly as we want, no matter the music, yet a discrete form of social pressure is exerted on us. That form of social pressure is developing in new ways today, thanks to audio geolocalization and customization, as shown is the following example of a party drone, that's its official name, set up in 2012 by a phone company and a musical streaming company. How it works. When people registered for festival tickets, we asked them to add their favorite song to our festival playlist on Spotify. When they came to collect their tickets, we could connect the right person to the right song. As they made their way from the ticket booth, the party drone accompanied them to the festival with the very song they selected earlier. The apparently kind invitation to dance, in fact, represents a very powerful injunction to behave accordingly to the festival management's expectations. The enchantment is as much a question of shaping the sound as shaping the ear that will receive it, receive it the space where it is broadcast, and the form of socialization that is taking place inside it. The second stop, sonic signposting, will make that even clearer. Let's hear it. Palais des Sports. This is an announcement for a tramway stop in the French city of Tours, composed by a man who is considered as the father of sound design in France, Louis Dandrel. As part of urban renovation works, various French cities have indeed created or restored their tramway lines, and most of them have asked composers to take care of all the sounds, announcements, or other signals. These composers, whose music I personally sometimes appreciate a lot, have all thought over these functional sounds very precisely, given very rational and creative explanations for their respective choices, and come up, with, come up with something that systematically sounds like an ad for the city. It sounds positive, beautiful, soothing, enchanted, and as a matter of fact, invariably tedious to my ears. Michel Redolfi did this for the tramway in, Bres in Brest. Bienvenue à bord du tramway. Cette rame est en direction de Porte de Guénou. And uh, Rodolphe Burger, a marvelous sound experimenter, that for the tramway in Paris. Ella Fitzgerald, Grand Moulin de Pantin. Ella Fitzgerald, Grand Moulin de Pantin. This promotion of an unconfictual and sanitized image of the city was further developed in Paris through sound art installations commissioned by the city when the tramway was first launched. In the Montsouris Park, notably, famous artist Christian Boltanski created Murmur, an installation consisting of loudspeakers being set beneath 10 benches in the park, that started de delivering endearment whisperings in various languages when someone sat down. 
This was certainly not challenging too much the cliché of Paris as the city of love, and the city management certainly appreciated it. The emergence of such sonic signposting is a very good thing is in many aspects, accessibility to the visually impaired or to foreigners being the main one. Yet, it is also problematic insofar as something very different from signposting is developing at the same time, which is city branding sound. Now, branding does not belong to the information category. But in the examples we have just heard, the same sounds are in fact doing some warning or information and some indirect advertising, whereas these are two very different functions. Let us move on to our third stop to understand that better. That's the safety sound. <laughs> That is the sound of an electric scooter owned by, as you might have guessed, Domino's Pizza, a food company. They call it the safe sound. The Dutch branch of the company decided a few years ago to replace its petrol scooters by electric ones. But it was then confronted to a problem, or rather an opportunity, that is keeping all the car manufacturers busy at the time being. If the electric engines are silent, and if we keep organizing the cities in the sole interest of cars, then what sound should the vehicle make in order to be spotted by the pedestrians and avoid accidents? Car manufacturers not only have acoustic labs to reduce unwanted sounds, but sound design labs to create wanted, useful, and supposedly beautiful sounds. In fact, they are compelled by regulations written by the European Commission or the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in the US to give their vehicles an audible sound that is easily recognizable as the sound of an accelerating, decelerating, or reversing vehicle. Now, as you might have heard, Domino's Pizza say sound also happens to be an advertising sound. What a splendid coincidence. This example underlines the problem in a caricatural way. Nowhere in the actual regulations is there a line saying that ads cannot be used as warning sounds. Now, we will probably not have a cacophony of cars and bikes shouting out their brand name every two seconds as they move through the city. The car manufacturers are working on something slightly subtler they focus on the symbolic expression of their bronze values. For instance, Harley Davidson has decided that its first electric motorcycle could not possibly sound less powerful than its own gas spice. Therefore, it makes the sound, the new electric bicycles, uh, motor bicycles, motorcycles make the sound of a fighter jet. Other sound designers, it must be underlined, consider the city as a whole and the car as part of a mass of other cars, and they design the car sound accordingly. They seem, they seem to share a certain taste for flying cars, a certain reference to Star Wars spacecrafts, and a certain will to make the car appear as the ultimate ecological solution, as we can now hear a uh, different sort of atmospheric sounds in the streets. I should show you the video because uh, even the uh, iconography of it all is uh, relevant. Mm -hmm. 
The car industry is not the only one to build on the confusion between information and marketing. The French National Train Company has also replaced the disciplinary bell in the voice of the railway worker of the 1940s. So they've replaced this by a sonic logo supposedly conveying sophisticated values such as eco mobility, to quote them, followed by the official and now only voice of the company, that's of Simon Hero. <laughs> Le TGV 7225 à destination de l'île Flandre va partir. Prenez garde à la fermeture automatique des portes. Attention au départ. The train company, prior to delivering us the information we need, now takes the time to repeat a narrative sound that summarizes, according to itself, what it wants us to think about itself. The true question is, Sound pollution is indeed probably going to decrease during the 21st century in Western towns. But do we simply want to replace the fog of engine noise by a myriad of carefully crafted and beautiful sounds? If you find that this is globally a great perspective for the soundscape, then maybe I should specify that those carefully crafted sounds are not just beautiful. They try and induce you to act in specific ways, as our fourth sonic stop will show. The regulating sound. This is the sound of the Paris subway pass in uh, the uh, La Défense station, a very big station in Paris. It was designed by sound designer Bernard Delage and composer Christian Zanesi. They actually extracted one note from the subway audio identity in order to deliver the information that, yes, your pass is still valid and you can go through the turnstile. They designed another sound, much less bright and shiny, to tell you that, no, you cannot take the subway unless you first refill your metro card. This one second sound actually bears three functions. First, remind us of the audio identity of the Paris subject, subway, like an, ev an ever repeating and individually activated sonic teaser. Second, to convey you and also the others, notably subway employees, some simple information about your pass and make you act adequately. Delage says that when there is no time for analysis, it is necessary to rely on the own behaviorist couple, stimulus, response. Ting, go, bonk, stop. Third function of the sound, also revealed by Delage himself, to accelerate the flow of people going through the turnstiles. And actually, if you stay near the turnstiles in a big subway station like La Défense, what strikes you is that a sort of synchronization operates between the people. Let's hear it again. There is a common rhythm. Ting, ting, ting. Only interrupted from time to time by a dissonant bonk, a silence, a bonk again as the person tries to pass through the, the turnstile again. In fact, it sounds very much like cashiers passing products in front of a beeping scanner. The beep tells them, tells the cashiers the product has been scanned and at the same time induces them to reach a quick and stable rhythm. The Paris subway has experimented other means to regulate the flow of passengers with sound by broadcasting sound creations in two very long corridors in order to accompany people from one end to the other and accelerating their pace, and accelerated their pace. These experimentations have remained local and occasional, yet they point out the emergence of a behaviorist sound behaviorist use of sound so as to control and guide the flow of human beings. 
They mark the assertion of a new form of authority, soft and almost imperceptible, yet very efficient to shape our use of public and private spaces. Sometimes that authority remains imperceptible to a majority of people while becoming obvious and aggressive to a minority. That is what we will hear in our fifth stop, that of social control. If you haven't heard anything, uh, this uh, does not mean that nothing was broadcast. In fact, it uh, says that it, it means that either the loudspeakers couldn't broadcast the sound because it is too high, it is outside the range of commonly used sounds, or you couldn't hear it because you are more than 25 years old. I couldn't say because I'm more than 25 years old, so I don't know if it has been broadcast or not. I just know that I sent the sound into the loudspeakers. In 2005, a British company called Compound Security Systems, CSS, had the idea to exploit a vulnerability of the human ear, which is that it ages very soon. As early as, 20, as early as 25 years old, we lose the ability to hear very high pitch frequencies. So CSS thought that was just perfect if you intend to target only youngsters, such as, according to the company's own legend, the boys who were annoying the CEO's daughter on her, on, on her way back from high school. In all logic, the daughter, being a teenager herself, should have been affected too, but the legend remains silent on this. So CSS built a device emitting a high-pitched sound at a disturbing amplitude. Not deafening, but definitely uncomfortable. Not an ultrasound, too high to be heard, but close to it. They call it the mosquito, a deliberate reference to their unnerving buzzing noise. Probably less deliberately, in choosing that name, they also paid an homage to their predecessor, the ultrasonic repellent used against animals, notably insects and rodents, since the 1950s. Next to the teenage setting, according to their own wording, they offer you the all-age frequency, which is a lower pitch, annoying sound, which you can hear in this BBC report in the London subway. Really help to get, get rid of this bit of lunatics around here. So you think it would keep people out of the subway? Oh, please, keep it up. Maybe if it was a bit louder. You think it should be louder? I don't think this would put me off loitering if I was going to loiter. It's horrendous and I wouldn't hang around. So you think it would work in that case? Yeah, can I go now? This device is uh, available for sale on the web. A company even had the idea to include it in children's playgrounds to make sure that nobody plays or chats when children's time is over. It is being used by public transportation systems, police station, apartment buildings, high schools, shops, or private individuals. It aroused several protest campaigns, notably one led by the Children's Commissioner in Great Britain, who pointed out that the device also affects babies, young children, and very reasonable teenagers. Yet, the company being very careful with the maximum sound level and other noise regulations, its sale was never prohibited. This does not mean that its use is not deeply problematic, even against less conforming youngsters. It is, in fact, a means to arbitrarily regulate the use of a public space, to sort out the people that can linger in it, to compel the under-25s to just go through it quickly. Quite far from the democratic and even constitutional principles, otherwise applying to, the pub to those public spaces in the Western countries where the device is being sold. For our last stop, we'll hear a more brutal and more authoritarian sound than the mosquito, one that is being used notably to silent protests. That's the sound of law and order. <laughs> Thank you. 
This is the sound of the LRAD, the long range acoustic device, here used during the anti G20 demonstration in Pittsburgh in 2009. Edward Corp invented it in 2004, and it was first used by the Navy, the US Navy, against Somalian pirates to enforce an exclusion area around its ships. It is actually, with police grenades, the only acoustic devices that appear usable in law and order after decades of research and rumors. It can broadcast in a fairly directional way music, language, or a medium sound, not a natural sound, and not an infrasound, as we frequently read, at an intensity greater than a plane at takeoff, up to 162 decibels. It is very efficient because it is designed to hurt the ear. The loudness is such that hearing protection will hardly help you. Indeed, if you stay in the broadcast area for too long, and we're not, we're not talking about hours, but about minutes, you can become totally or partially deaf. That actually happened to Karen Piper, a university professor who was observing the Pittsburgh demonstration. She sued the city of Pittsburgh for her hearing loss and won her case in 2012, receiving $72,000 for the damages. That is the value of one of your ears. In the army, the air rat can help maximize the impact of classical lethal weapons. British researchers from the Bradford Non-Lethal Weapons Research Project documented that the, what they called a pre-lethal use of the device during the last Iraq war. GIs broadcast the alarm sound at full volume and made the snipers, that made the snipers uh, drop their guns, protect their ears and run and the GIs shot them uh, in the meantime. Police grenades operate in a similar way. In the US, they fire a flash and a bang. In France, they fire tear gas or rubber bullets along with sound intensities up to 165 decibels. Quite enough to deafen you and certainly very efficient to startle and deter you from approaching a given area. Here is a compilation made by independent journalist Alexis Kralande in April 2018 on the ZAD of Notre-Dame-des-Landes, a rural area in France where people fought against uh, the installation of an airport, uh, which they won. The, the airport was uh, abandoned. And they also fought for new ways of building communities and they had to face a very, uh, very violent repression from the police. The ARAD and the police grenades send orders you cannot oppose. All you can do is run away from them and protect yourself. It allows, from the police and city perspective, an hygienic management of public spaces. Loud sound can literally clean up an area from all human beings within a matter of seconds and leave no trace. It can deploy and fold up an invisible geography and demand like a vacuum bell jar to muffle or suppress any shouting, chanting, clapping, singing, or dissenting. To conclude, we have traveled from supposedly enchanting sounds to definitely authoritarian ones. Despite their great discrepancies as far as, as, far as form and intent are concerned, they build a common continuum in which sound is being used for attractive or repellent, informative or advertising purposes, as a means to drive our collective and individual behaviors. Under the pretext of sound innovation, we are witnessing ethical shifts. 
The development of sonic signposting can bring great improvements provided it is not diverted to other means like the privatization of public space, the arbitrary petition of that public space, the segmentation of uses and people that are admitted in a specific place at a specific moment, the confusion between information and advertisement. At the heart of the matter, the problem, the problem is that the sonic cake is being shared by private actors without any public debate. Yet, there are many other ways to employ sound in public spaces as a place of political, social, artistic and philosophical expression. Other ways to imagine sound and sound spaces have to be built. Maybe considering sonic space as part of the commons would be an interesting start. Canadian composer Sarah Boothroyd did so in Rebel Rousers as she created a musical composition out of recordings of the Occupy Wall Street movement in 2011. Let's give the final word to sound, not as a final stop, but on the, on the contrary, as an opening. Thank you.